Hi, my name is Marielena Grimmett, and I'm here today to tell you about my research regarding the removal of sulfamethazine from, real, from realistic environments using hypercrossing adsorbent resin MN250. Sulfamethazine is a veterinary antibiotic. It's typically used in cattle and swine to promote their health and growth, but the problem is that those animals can excrete it up to 90% unmetabolized. And because of sulfamethazine's high soil mobility and slow degradation, it gets into the groundwater very easily and can persist. Hypercrossing adsorbents have an extremely high surface area of up to 1,000 meters squared per gram of resin. They have several novel abilities, such as the ability to swell two to three times the original size in a liquid system, their ability to remove both polar and nonpolar contaminants, and the fact that they can be regenerated over 2,000 times, which makes them an eco-friendly and cost-effective product. In seventh grade, I, I performed a column flow study screening four different types of hypercrossing adsorbents to see which one would best remove sulfamethazine. And I found that resin MN250 was able to bring the concentra concentration down from 311 micrograms per liter to non-detectable levels in less than seven and a half minutes. The purpose of my eighth grade experiment was to further characterize the winning resin, resin MN250, by performing batch adsorption techniques in deionized water. You can read more about my 7th and 8th grade research in the 2013 edition of the Journal of Environmental Quality. Overall, what I had found is that the resin is very favorable to remove sulfamethazine due to its high adsorption capacity, capacity with minimal desorption in deionized water. Although, up to that point, I had only done research in deionized water. So further studies were still needed to determine how the resin would perform in realistic systems, such as in the presence of humic acid, at varying pHs, with ions in the solution, and at varying ionic strengths. Oops. So the purpose of my ninth grade experiment was to determine how well this resin would work while in the presence of humic acid. I adjusted the pH of my stock solutions that year to 6.33 so that I could compare it to my previous year's deionized water data. Here I have my adsorption isotherm or the capacity graph and I found that Langmuir's model fit my data the best that year. So as you can see, the curve of my humic acid data is actually above the curve of my deionized water data. What that means is that the resin was actually able to remove more sulfamethazine by about 15% while in the presence of humic acid. My theory for this is that I believe that humic acid molecules may be acting as a carrier for the sulfamethazine onto the resin bead. And here with my kinetics graph, as you can see, the deionized water data reached equilibration after 59 hours, while with humic acid in the solution, the equilibration time was prolonged up to 138 hours. And the goal of an interparticle diffusion model is to tell you what rate limiting step caused your experiment to take so long. The three rate limiting steps being boundary layer diffusion, interparticle diffusion, and adsorption sites. So when I plotted my data, I found I had a bilinear line. So for the first portion of the line, that part, I found that because the y-intercept goes through zero, that would suggest that the rate limiting step is caused by interparticle diffusion which makes a lot of sense since humic acid molecules are very large and could have gone into the pores of the resin bead and blocked access for the sulfamethazine. But for the second portion of the line, that high y-intercept is proportional to boundary layer thickness, which is in turn caused by adsorption sites spreading out by the end of the experiment. In conclusion, I found that resin m 250 has a very high capacity, actually performing better in humic acid as compared to deionized water. The purpose of my 10th grade experiment was to determine how well the resin would perform while at varying pHs, specifically at pHs 5, 7, and 9, while in the presence of common groundwater ions. I created my groundwater ion solution according to a formula that I found in Lou's article, which I found accurately represented Florida groundwater. So here I have my adsorption isotherm or the capacity graph for the pH study. I have my pH 5 data in red, the pH 7 is in black, and pH 9 is in blue. Overall, what I discovered is that the resin tends to work better at lower pHs, such as pH 5 or 7, as compared to pH 9. So if you were to compare the pH 5 data to the pH 7 data, you'll see that it, or excuse me, <laughs> comparing pH 5 to pH 9, you'd see that at pH 5, the resin does about 50 to 60% better. 
And then if you compare the pH 7 to pH 9, at those higher CE values, the resin does about 75% better. Now, these findings make a lot of sense when you understand the pKa of the sulfamethazine molecule and the zeta potential for the resin. So the sulfamethazine molecule has an amine and an amide group. And that amide group on the sulfamethazine actually causes the sulfamethazine to be negatively charged above the pH 7.49, while it's neutral below the pH 7.49. And it won't become positive until you reach near pH 2. Now, the resin actually has a crossover point at pH 4, causing it to be negatively charged above the pH 4 and positive below the pH 4. So that means when you're at pH 9, when up to 97% of the sulfamethazine molecules are negatively charged, the resin is also at its most negative state, and that's obviously not very favorable. But then when you look back down at pH 5, where the resin is much less negative and almost none of the sulfamethazine are negatively charged, that's obviously a much better situation for the resin and the sulfamethazine. And here with the adsorption kinetics, I found that the pH 5 and 9 data took 144 hours to reach full equilibration, while it took 120 hours for the pH 7 data to reach equilibration. And it's interesting to note that at pH 7, the resin had the fastest rate of uptake, as you can tell by how steep that curve is. So in conclusion, I found that the resin tends to perform better at lower pHs, such as pH 5 or 7, as compared to pH 9. So in 11th grade, I investigated how varying ionic strength would affect the resin's ability to remove sulfamethazine. So specifically, I tested it at a 0 0.005, 0 0.05, and 0.5 molar potassium chloride solutions. I chose potassium chloride as a surrogate electrolyte because both the potassium and chloride are small enough to get into the smallest pores of the resin bead. In addition, potassium is known to have a more broad hydra hydration shell than sodium, which is more likely to promote sul something like salting out. So here I have my adsorption isotherm or the capacity graph. And first of all, when you end up comparing the 0 0.005 molar data to the 0 0.05 molar data, which is the red data to the black data, you'll see that there's actually drop in, a drop in the adsorption capacity by about 34%. Now, the reason why this likely happens is that, well, there's a few reasons. So the ions might actually be surrounding the resin bead, creating what's known as an electric double layer. And that might interfere with adsorption at the solid liquid interface. In addition, the ions might be surrounding the sulfamethazine molecule, creating what's known as a shielding effect, which actually drops the activity coefficient of the sulfamethazine. Or the ions could simply be interfering with the surface of the resin bead, which would also fear, interfere with sulfamethazine's mechanism of absorption. Now, the next part, what I found is really quite interesting, because when you look at the 0.05 molar data compared to the 0.5 molar data, the capacity actually increases. Now, the reason why I think that happens is because of salting out. So what's happening is when you're getting up to those extreme potassium chloride concentrations, the solubility of the sulfamethazine actually drops by about 50%. And that activity coefficient increases exponentially. And that acts as a driving force to get the sulfamethazine on to the resin bead. So here I have my adsorption kinetics graph. And what's most interesting about this graph is that when you compare the 0 0.005 molar data compared to the 0 0.05 molar data, you'll see that that initial rate of adsorption actually drops by about 34%. But then when you look at the 0 0.05 molar data compared to the 0 0.5 molar data, the initial rate of adsorption increases by 74%, even surpassing the initial 0 0.005 molar data. So you can really see how something out is playing a big role in this part of the experiment. So in conclusion, I found that resin MN250 has, is a very effective resin at removing sulfamethazine in a variety of realistic situations, such as in the presence of humic acid, with, in the presence of common groundwater ions, at varying pHs, and at varying ionic strengths. You can actually read more about these data in my latest, my latest publication, again, in the Journal of Environmental Quality. So, you may have noticed that throughout my experiment, it did take a very long time for my experiment to reach full equilibration, which would be problematic in a real system in that in the real world, you'd either need a really large tank of resin or a slow flow rate. 
But the reason why that's actually okay is because in my experiments, I was using sulfamethazine concentrations that were actually five orders of magnitude greater than what's actually found in the environment. So when you take it back down to realistic sulfamethazine concentrations, you end up being at the best part of the absorption rate curve, which is highly favorable for the resin. And future research. Over the summer, I actually continued my experiment by further investigating humic acid absorption. I wanted to see how humic acid by itself would get absorbed into the resin because that might shed some more light on what happened in ninth grade when humic acid was acting as a carrier for sulfamethazine. In addition, you could always perform experiments to see how this resin does in, uh, with other competing contaminants in the water. Well, you can develop the regeneration protocols or even analyze the mechanism of absorption via X-ray diffraction or infrared spectroscopy. Thank you, and I would like to thank the Siemens Foundation for putting on this amazing event, as well as the George Washington University for hosting this, as well as Discovery. Thank you.